Okay. So, um, uh, great to be able to uh, be with you. And um, uh, I'm going to be delivering this this talk, which I offered uh, at the CanMod um, uh, Modeling Consortium meeting in uh, Banff in November. Um, and it's on compositional modeling. And um, at a broader level, it's about our group's Seffel's um, use of applied category theory in support of, of mathematical and computational epidemiology. And uh, it's really the product of work by many parties, um, several of them um, currently joining us. Um, but I'm, I'm also going to depart some from the original conception to talk about some further developments which have occurred um, since November. Um, I did want to begin this talk as I did the November one, just uh, honor the the uh, memory of of my father, who's both an uh, inspiration um, and uh, you know a uh, an example for a lot of our work. Um, as many of you know, we um, within a, uh, just the week before this talk, uh, uh, we held his funeral and burial, um, uh, and uh, it was a tragic loss of this past year. But I think, in many ways, the work I'm going to be talking about today carries on his his legacy, carries on um, some of the things that he would have felt most worthy in terms of contributions. So th this work, at a deeper level, is is based on the observation that that really when it comes to modeling, teams, interdisciplinary teams are the unit of success. Um, and um, and uh, what, what determines whether um, a modeling project is impactful or not uh, is often not merely the, the technical excellence of the work, but its ability to tap the knowledge, the lived experience, the, um, the uh, personal understanding of the system, often tacit, of wide varieties of parties. And, and as such, uh, I, I believe from our work and from all these boot camps I've run, et cetera, there's this key role of enabling interdisciplinary team formation, but, but facilitation and, and training. And um, a, a key component of that, as, as many people realize here, um, uh, is a conviction as to the importance of involving system stakeholders and people with lived experience who may may not be experts in a formal sense in certain areas of say a sprawling healthcare system or a public health system but have lived experience um as you know someone who's been through homelessness or been through substance use challenges um uh who struggled with issues of intimate partner violence um, and I do believe here that diversity within the team, different life experiences, um, different knowledge sets, is not a liability, but, a, but an asset. It, it really brings, uh, you know, uh, a depth of, of understanding of these larger systems of which we're parts. And um, I've long been a, a big proponent of, of agile modeling, you know, something we first started um articulating in around two, uh, 2010 um uh this this need to uh engage early and often with stakeholders and people with lived experience often building models alongside either physically I think Kurt alongside Jenny Basran and and health, health quality council um in 2014 2015 um, or think uh, Jenna with Patty Mabry uh, remotely, or uh, Wade with Alex Doroshenko, et cetera. Um, uh, and our involvement, people like Liz uh, and people with lived experience in some of our hackathons. Um, in this context, um, model structure and assumptions about the model are, are, are constantly visible to people with lived experience in the ideal world with people who are knowledgeable experts and can be critiqued. Um, you know, often it's not until they see a model um, structure and dialogue about it, or until they see the emergent behavior of a model, that certain tacit knowledge, certain understanding of the system, certain experience 
certain memories come out. Um, it's it's when those things are prompted at some level um, that team members can help challenge, can help critique, can evolve model assumptions. And and I think everyone here knows my conviction that when someone challenges our model, when we find a problem with it through inability to to um, uh, to jibe it with a person's lived experience. That's not a failure of modeling, it's a success of learning. And models are nothing if not learning instruments, learning processes, as Jeff McDonald would say. Um, and you know, there's a there's a key need here for to be able to critique it, for the model to be transparent to stakeholders from broad backgrounds, for the team to understand the model behavior and, and interpret data from the world, interpret what's going on in the world in light of what's posited, what's hypothesized in the model structure. Um, and for a long time, I felt that there's moreover a need to um, customize model output on a per stakeholder basis. And, um, you know, in this context, uh, We've often involved, we've often, you know, made use of um, participatory modeling efforts to try to draw out the lived experience of others. Uh, these ones are from Peter Hoffman's kind of broadly parallel efforts uh, with with a causal loop and stock and flow diagrams. We've done a lot with uh, agent based and hybrid models, um, and including with uh, some of the, you know, some of the context here. And uh, I don't think to this crowd, uh, you have to, you know, hold forth on this, but, you know, involving people with lived experience and stakeholders has numerous advantages. To this point in this talk, I've been emphasizing the, uh, the need and the value that comes from all these diverse lived experiences and knowledge bases to challenge and increase the the um uh the the, the uh to ground the model to to increase its its correspondence with things in the world to help you know um tie it better and better to a a good description of the world but there's a lot more than that right um it can help foster stakeholder buy in or even a sense of um ownership uh, it can help ensure that if recommendations come out of the model, they are act they're more likely to be acted on because people know where it comes from and and trust it more. They can facilitate responsive data collection. If stakeholders understand how the model's representing something, it may bring up either explicit or tacit knowledge about data, you know, germane to that or about their observations related to this. Um, and uh, you know, in some cases, it can empower community self guidance, uh, self you know, um, uh, communities shaping their own health futures. Um, now, as everyone here again is aware, um, our group makes use of um, many modeling lenses, and and often in conjunction with each other, system dynamics modeling, agent based modeling, discrete event, often hybridized with each other to great effect with a whole greater than the sum of its parts. Um, we're gonna be focusing for this talk on system dynamics modeling, um, but I'm going to later this talk, talk about some factors related to agent-based modeling, which is month by month, week by week, day by day, nay, hour by hour even right now, on um, the focus of a lot of my attention with applying similar methods, categorical methods for compositional modeling. Right now, we're in the midst of a really big push to bring the success that many of you have secured over in the system dynamics area for compositional system dynamics. So the work of people like uh, Xia Yan, uh, like Alex, like Thomas uh, Purdy, um, uh, and uh, through the efforts of Eric with Model Colab and others, we're trying to bring that over to, to agent-based modeling. Um, now, within system dynamics, um, 
we have a particularly rich um, um, breadth of, of model description, um, a spectrum of levels of detail with which system and dynamics diagrams codified as causal loop diagrams or system structure diagrams or stock and flow diagrams um, explicate, help flesh out um, assumptions about the model. Each of the, these gives us a different lens and a different language for describing systems in the world. But these are not solitudes. These, these different languages relate to one another in structured ways. And you can, you can broadly think of, you know, if we have a diagram that's a causal loop diagram, um, and we we can take that and be insp inspired to sharpen its distinctions and go to system structure diagrams by incorporating distinctions between stocks and flows, and we can go to, um, and, and we can go then to, but but leaving out formulas, et cetera, and then going to stock and flow diagrams. So we can think of this elaboration process, this explication process as sharpening our distinction, sharpening our, our level of uh, specificity, our detail about this system. From the floor and BAMP, I, I talked some about causal loop diagrams, about this encoding you know, with variables and links between them, links that are annotated with with uh, uh, polarities. Uh, I spoke about how that can um, capture positive causal structure, right? Um, so if a link between two variables is associated with a positive link, um, say associated with um, uh, time spent around other smokers, to social ties uh, to and with other smokers, that would indicate that if the source rises, um, all of the things being equal, the target will rise compared to the value it otherwise would have had. So it doesn't necessarily mean rise over time. It rises compared to the value it would have had had this not risen, right? All of the things being equal. By contrast, a, a link to that's negative, um, say, a, 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 so where there's a, a negative polarity would indicate that as the source variable rises, so if we have a link from A to B and if A rises, say health rises, then um, it would lead to a decrease. So if one is in better health, it leads to a, a, a less of a, a commitment to cessation. If a smoker's um, in really good health, it, you know, uh, if their health it gets better and better that they have less commitment to the need to the to the immediacy of the urgency of ceasing and so it's with a negative link as this goes up this goes the the target goes down compared to the value it otherwise would have had all the other things being equal now a diagram like this of course from these individual links we can compose and i'm going to use that word in a categorical sense these arrows and get a polarity for for pathways, and that includes the overall loops, right? Um, so we we compose things with a rule of signs. Um, uh, there's some other cases that, you know, uh, Thomas working with with uh, Xia Yan um, and others have worked out, um, but generally it's by a rule of signs. You know, uh, two negatives make a positive, a positive and a negative make a negative for the the impact along the entire pathway. So if you have a pathway composed of many links, we can compose the polarities associated with the links in a structured way with the rule of signs to get a polarity associated with the pathway. So as smoking rises, how does commitment to cessation, the whole end of that pathway, does it tend to rise or fall, all the other things being equal? And two negatives make a positive. So as smoking rises, compared to the value it otherwise would have had, uh, one's health, after some delay, decreases, and as one helps decrease, the commitment to cessation could rise. So the net effect is a positive one from smoking to commitment to cessation. Uh, a rise in smoking will lead to a rise in commitment to cessation compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all other things being equal. Now, 
Importantly, and, and I think this will be no surprise to people within our group, um, while it, it may seem that this is all, you know, sort of vague and, and, and broad and, and, you know, what do we really get out of, of reasoning about these polarities? We get a lot. And one of the things we get is actually reasoning about behavior of the system. And the rules here are not as uh, cut, and, cut and dry as they will be, say, for full stock and flow diagrams. But, you know, by and large, when we have a positive feedback, whether it's composed of two positive links or two negative links or some larger number where it's a rule of signs so the result is positive, um, we get unstable behavior, divergent behavior. Deviations are amplified. There's kind of a piling on effect, a snowballing effect where the more one smokes, the more one's addicted to nicotine, develops a physical dependence, which leads to more smoke, which leads to more physical dependence, and it spirals in a stronger and stronger way. And so you get this kind of, from this loop alone, if it's, if it's not, if it's not um, you know, balanced out by other factors not shown out here, by that loop alone, you get divergent behavior, more and more and more, faster and faster. By contrast, if you have a balancing loop, something like I grow hungry, I, I eat food, and that lessens my hunger, it leads to more stable behavior. It leads to behavior that resists change. And if, if some perturbation, some change is caused, the system will bounce back to some equilibrium, some homeostasis, perhaps in this case, right? If, if I... Um, grow thirsty, I take a drink, I uh, restore my, my equilibrium. If I grow cold, perhaps I you know start to shiver and that warms my body up a bit or I'll put a uh, put something warmer on and, and that will raise uh, raise my temperature. So systems which have negative loops tend to you know restore uh, towards some balance, some state of balance. It tends towards stability rather than in the sort of instability we see here. And if there's a delay, we, you know, we see it uh, um, restoring stability with with some with some oscillations often. Now, the point is that these diagrams um, encode our best understanding, our positive understanding of the situation. But they also lead to expectations on the behavioral side. Um, the diagrams have um, meaning to us for reasoning about behavior we see in the world. Uh, and even, even with this very you know, broad brush characterization of links, not going into any quantitative relationships, we can often draw insight to why we see certain divergent behavior in the world, like a sudden rise in the number of infectives in the early stage of an outbreak. So those are causal loop diagrams. The diagrams help us reason about system structure, but they also help us reason about behavior. This is a hallmark of system dynamics diagrams, and we're going to see it carry over now to system structure diagrams. So in system structure diagrams, as some of those here may know, We, we capture, like causal loop diagrams, polarity interlinking factors. But we sharpen the situation. We, sh we sharpen the distinctions we make. Whereas in causal loop diagrams, we kind of just you know, describe variables in, in kind of a blunter way. Here, we, we take extra efforts to distinguish variables that are stocks, accumulations, aspects of state of the system um, from flows, fluxes, rates of change in those, right? Um, and, and this is, regardless of whether we have data about one, one of these pieces or not, um, we're, we're still characterizing system structure but in a way that sharpens these distinctions between stocks, flows, and we'll often leave some variables as, you know, without those distinctions. But for the core areas, often we spend quite a bit of thinking about what's a stock and what's a flow. 
Um, we'll still reason about the loops and the, you know, uh, reason about the 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 um, polarities of different pathways, um, and illustrate balancing loops versus reinforcing loops. Um, but we're doing so with added sharpened distinctions, right? Um, and you know, this opens up to us additional avenues for reasoning that are really powerful. We get the sort of insights we get from causal loop diagrams, but we get more than that. We get the ability to, to bring in stock and flow reasoning, right? You, you know, using a diagram, a stock and flow diagram like this, as most people here will know, you can start to reason about observations, say, from the world, about a quantity you have identified here as a stock and why it's behaving that way in terms of the flows, right? Not just in terms of, is it involved in a positive feedback loop, but in terms of inflow and outflow. And we know that anyone here could probably tell me if inflow is greater than outflow, the value of the stock rises, right? Um, if outflow is greater than inflow, the value of the stock declines. If the two are equal, the value of the stock is in stasis. It stays the same. Um, and what this is doing is it's it's bringing up new avenues for us to take this diagram and gain insight as to why we're seeing certain types of system behavior. How will the system behave if we intervene in certain areas? Why is the certain system behave that way? And this takes us beyond causal loop distinctions, rich as those were, to reasoning about the stocks and the flows. And, and that adds a lot to our ability to reason about behavior that we see. This is really important. I'm trying to emphasize that in system dynamics, unlike a lot of other contexts, diagrams are not merely stepping stones for transiently capturing behavior where, you know, the real the real insights come all from differential equations or or from writing computer code or something. No, 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 no. You know, here we're we're actually using the diagrams, yes, to capture knowledge. Yes, to help us think, formalize our understanding of system structure, but also to reason about that structure. The diagram serves as a way of visually reasoning in a way that retains its value. We don't throw it away as soon as we get to differential equations. We retain it because it helps us reason visually about why we are certain uh, we are seeing certain behavior in the system, often with greater clarity with considerably greater clarity than if we were just using differential equations to, to encode it. Now, when we get to stock and flow diagrams, we have those distinctions, but we sharpen things more, right? And, and the kind of standard um, way of, of taking a stock and flow diagram and encoding governing behavior, if, uh, the processes governing behavior from it, is through a set of ordinary differential equations, such as that shown here. And of course, we can elaborate those, and our group has a long experience in elaborating them, say, to, to stochastic differential equations. But here, we're, we're taking this structure, and we're annotating it with uh, additional constitutive relationships, descriptions of you know, the formulas, the govern, how much, um, uh, the rate of infection, the number of people per day being infected, depends on susceptibles and infectives. And and I, re I realize not everyone here is 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 familiar with with the details of the notation, but we lend enough specificity to this diagram that it has unambiguous interpretation. That doesn't mean it's correct necessarily, but it's it's unambiguous, right? We in terms of its um processes governing its behavior, um and, and we posit that this is governing factors in the world. Um, and what's important to realize here is that, you know, while you can kind of transliterate this diagram into stock and flow, into ordinary differential equations, translated from a stock and flow diagram into ordinary differential equation, you know, what what's, it, it loses some of its, I could say structural integrity, that's not quite what I word, but structural wholeness. You know, like a given 
flow here turns into two pieces here, right? It's fragmented in the underlying ordinary differential equations. This flow turns into these two pieces. It's a transliteration process that's straightforward, but it, it you, you lose the ability to kind of see the diagram often when you look at these, particularly if you know, you're canceling some of these factors when they happen to cancel out or, or what have you. Um, uh, combining them, you, you don't see the diagram. And, you know, for this sort of stock and flow reasoning, we need to see the diagram, right? We reason through the diagram. Now, you know, since 1993 or so, I've been applying an enthusiastic practitioner of system dynamics of all three of these types, cause loop diagrams, system structure diagrams, system dynamics, uh, stock and flow diagrams, finally. And it's a tradition I love, um, but it has some serious weaknesses in traditional software. You know, there's this lack of model modularity. We typically build monolithic models and this lack of ability to take models together and glue them together, plug them together to get it to get a bigger model. Um, you know, while we have codification of things like molecules or archetypes in the system dynamics literature, I'd refer any of you to the the fifth discipline by Peter Senge or some of Jim Hines' work on formalizing dozens of molecules, these reusable idioms that are like um like software patterns that we see in 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 software. These are like modeling system dynamics modeling patterns. Um these are recognized, but we we're, they're not building blocks. We're not not we can't glue them together and build up a model uh, out of those, despite their ubiquity. Um, and 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 amazingly, you know, even though these going from this to this is a process of successive explication, successive sharpening as we go down here of these distinctions. Um, uh, there's there's really a lack of formalization of the relationships between these diagrams. It's as if there are three solitudes. Um, and, and despite the fact that, you know, one is, is, is naturally an, a, a sort of elaboration of another. It's a sharpening of another. Um, you know, traditional system dynamics software is much to recommend it. It's done a great deal to enable visual reasoning about why we see behavior in terms of stocks flows, in terms of feedbacks. But it's really poor for marshalling team contributions, for recognizing that the unit of modeling success is not the individual modeler at a desktop with hand on keyboard and mouse. It's the team. Um, and modeling success needs to be driven, um, can be most driven as a high leverage activity by facilitation of teams. Um, and right now there's this bizarre focus on single user support where it needs to be support of team members. Um, there's a semantic inflexibility. We privilege an ODE interpretation, even though we could interpret this in stochastic fashions or delay differential equation fashions. Uh, we could view it as discrete counts of number of susceptibles who transition over instead of, you know, um, continuous quantities. And finally, stratification obscures uh, pathways. So, you know, models are, um, are often characterized in sectors or portions, but um, we're not really capturing those effectively. And for those who have not worked with it. I can speak from lived experience and uh, at least computational trauma to the horrors that can come when we take a model and we try to stratify it by growing numbers of distinctions. Say, take a model of HPV and, and dividing it up into age groups and two cervical screening groups and three sexual activity groups and two smoking statuses and two sexes. And you get formulae that look like this and where the 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 form of the model the shape of the model the logic of the model is obscured in a welter an entangled mess of of these sort of overwhelming formulas that get in the way of understanding system structure um 
uh, I mentioned these these are solitudes. Um, so so these are weaknesses. And to address these, we can work with categorical approaches um, here. Uh, and here um, we're, we're putting our backs into this for several reasons. To achieve transparency for stakeholders, to support modularity in modeling, to build models that are reusable, testable, reproducible, clearly documented, publishable, shareable, um, and reusable pieces. Um, we're seeking by by building together system dynamics, very much a a visual tradition of working with diagrams with category theory approaches. Again, very much a visual approach working with diagrams. We're seeking to enable, to dignify, to facilitate, and to enrich and empower diagrammatic reason. We're seeking the ability to abstract, to, to build up model chunks that can be reused, whether it's molecules on the small scale or large pieces of models that have been published in the literature in which others can reuse as building blocks for their own models, as sort of validated components, tested components, peer-reviewed components. What's he going to foster composability, ability to glue together these, these sub-pieces into a whole, and critically, to separate the form of a model, its shape, what's connected with what within the diagram from its meaning, its semantics. So a given shape, perhaps it's this shape here, could be used for many different purposes. It can be interpreted with many different lenses. For simulation, yes, for calibration, for loop gain, for eigenvalue elasticity analysis, for particle filtering, for particle MCMC, for, for parameter sweeps and sensitivity analysis. Um, for all these different purposes, without having to go recode your your model in this way, we want to support um, a really rich way of stratifying models that avoids this sort of curse of dimensionality, this combinatorial entangling and 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 blow up that we get with traditional stratification, by hand stratification. And we don't want to ossify stratification into the model. Rather, we want to, we don't want to build it and hard code it in the model. We want to be able to nimbly mix in distinctions by sex and then easily take them out. We want to be able to transform it um, so we can reason about its behavior soundly and optimize it and parallelize it. Um, something will be very important for agent-based modeling. Um, and critically, we want to move beyond the three solitudes here um, and, and recognize that it is the destiny of these, these diagrams to be linked with one another, um, to, to be recognized as successive elaborations, successive sharpenings. Uh, and um, additionally, um, we want to provide a representation for future proofing our models by allowing, as we build in richer descriptions, we can migrate our models over um, instead of them having to be tied into one version of a schema and support for multi-scale modeling. So um, as several people here know, uh, you know, we're, we're performing these efforts with uh, Cat Lab and uh, atop the programming language Julia, and particularly as part of the algebraic Julia ecosystem, um, alongside things like algebraic Petri or algebraic dynamics. And uh, Xiao Yan first introduced, and Alex and, and Thomas um, uh, have been contributing to stockflow.jl. So I want to talk people through what are key elements of this approach. Um, uh, the, the first and arguably most important thing is to recognize that we encode the form of the model um, using uh, an approach called 
um, at a at a mathematical level, they're called copreciaves or attributed copreciaves. Um, in the in the um, uh, the CATLAB context, they're called attributes, which is the pronunciation of this attributed C sets. And so the idea here is we have a model schema, which kind of describes the grammar of models, what can be connected with what. So for example, outflows are a type of flow, inflows are a type of flow, outflows have a stock out of which they flow, inflows have a stock into which they flow. There's links for dynamic variables that link a dynamic variable up with a stock on which it depends. And 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 this describes kind of the form of the model. A given diagram like this um, can be described by the schema. Um, and specifically, it's in what we call an instance of the schema. And specifically, we map this schema, this notion of this co pre sheaf, we map this schema into so there's a, a category presented by this schema. Um that's a categorical concept. Well, we mapped it into map it into something called category of sets, or more specifically fin set. And and so each stock um gets a number. There's there's gonna be stock one, which might be S, stock two, which might be R, stock three, which uh, excuse me, it might be I, and stock three, which might be R. I uh, each flow. Um gets mapped into uh, a set of flows. Um, and you can see them here. Flow one is inf, flow two is is recover. Um, and these so-called morphisms here, these mappings here, say between an outflow um, as a sort of subset, as it were, of, of flows, get turned into sets, that to, to functions that map from these outflows, um, in this case, it's um, uh, an, an outflow of inf from stock one s. Um, uh, there's a, a map, a, a function that maps each of these O's um, to each of these uh, each of these flows. So each outflow maps to some flow for that cor that it corresponds to, and similarly. There's some stock for it. So each outflow is flowing out of a particular stock. So outflow one, which is inf, flows, that's from, from this. I know it's flow, inf, flows out of stock one. Flow two flows out of stock two. Um, and so it is for each of these. And, and we even encode uh, through Cheyenne's uh, efforts together with uh, Alex and, and Thomas, um, kind of the formulas. Uh, associated with the stock, um, uh, well, sorry, with the with the various um, parts of this diagram that describe exactly what the formulas are within the stock and flow model. Now, in Algebraic Julia, in this uh, package in CatLab, um, there's really nice ways to represent things like this. Categories like that, which present um, uh, diagrams, which present a category. Can be encoded. You say what the what the objects are in the category. S is an object. S V uh, is an object here. Um, flow is an object. Um, and then there's you encode each of these maps. So uh, O F N is a, a, is a link is a link from O to F. So this this kind of domain specific language introduced by CatLab, um, and we specify some extra attributes like the names that, that have to be maintained. Um, now, to support this, um, Alex uh, early on pioneered the, um, the use of domain-specific languages. And in Julia, um, the way to do this is, is through something called macros. And for those who have seen C macros, um, these are entirely of a different sort. C macros are these kind of lexical constructs, which are basically string substitution. This is really manipulating kind of what are called abstract syntax trees, representations of codes, and you, you can kind of map them into other code. It's a very powerful tradition inherited from Lisp languages. Um, so um, Alex created this little language for stock and flow diagrams where you can describe the stocks the parameters in those diagrams, the dynamic variables and the formulas for those, and can um, uh, can describe uh, these, can either use these dynamic variables uh, here and provide um, 
uh, further formulas here for the flows. Uh, and you can provide what are called sum variables. So a given diagram could be described with this and it gets turned into code, which can produce diagrams, which are subject to ungainly depiction right now with graph viz, which simply look like this. But if you squint your eyes, you could see a stock flow model with S, I, and R, and there's an infection flow, that's what this is. And there's a recovery flow, that's what this is. And, um, and you can see, um, you know, this total population is the sum of S, I, and R, et cetera. Now, all of this beneath the hood depends on some really neat whiz-bang category theory, theoretic constructs. And one of the most critical ones is something called a structured co-span. And, and a structured co-span basically provides us this way of describing something with which can be uh, glued together. It's, it describes open constructs, in this case, open stock flow diagrams. So here you have these feet, which um, uh, specify kind of interfaces that can be glued together with other things. And you have a, um, you have something at the apex, um, which can be linked to by these interfaces. And this is map that says, where does this kind of interface relate to this? So maybe you have a entire diagram here and you have uh, little feet, which, which, um, dock with pieces of it. So this foot, for example, might dock with, um, so you have S, which would be this dock S, or I with this dock. Those are points where we could glue models together, or similarly this, this N here, this variable. So these are kind of these, these interfaces into this overall construct, this overall uh, picture. And it turns out that um, this is technically called an adjunction that relates this um, can can be mapped into these things in a uh, as as kind of sets and and this thing just a, a collection of items from this uh, stock flow diagram. And I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but you can go and uh, basically create. The stock flow diagrams, uh, in this case, can be done for algebra, for Petri nets and, and, and through other variants, et cetera. And you have these little interfaces to them. Um, and there's this beautiful mathematical structure that relates it to, um, uh, to a, uh, a depiction um, in two different categories. One is kind of a a fancier uh, category with more structure and one is a category with things like uh, 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 sets. Now, um, the, the advantage of doing this, um, of having these interfaces is we can glue things together at the interfaces. So if we have two stock flow models, one X, that's this one here, and one Y, that's this one here. Um, and they have a, and we, we have a, a, a leg in common, one of these feet in common, I guess we'd call it a foot. Um, so that says where S is in X, and it also says where S is in Y, and it also says where N is in S, and N is in Y. Then we can glue them together. This is with what's called a push out, which is basically like we have X and we have Y separately, except we unify, we fuse together, we recognize that they have points of overlap. S is the same between the two of them. And we fuse that together. N is the same between the two of them. We fuse that together. So that's, it's kind of like saying we have either this or this, except these things are in common. And we get a diagram out that's kind of these two glued together around S in this case and around N. And that gives what we call a composed diagram. A diagram that is um, uh, that is linked uh, together. Um, uh, so we, where we we have linked these sub pieces into a bigger diagram. And and for example, you could have a SEIR diagram, and we could have a diagram. So that might focus on the natural history of infection with, let's say, flu. Right, susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, and then we could have another diagram that is. Um, 
uh, that has susceptible, exposed, infected, and, and vaccinated. Uh, and this represents the vaccination process. The people who are susceptible can get vaccinated, but those people are subject to some risk of infection and go on to this E state if they're infected. So these are two different diagrams with some common points. Like um, we might formulate these diagrams modularly separately, but when we want to stick them together, we say, wait, the S here is the same as this S. E here is the same as that one. I here is the same as this one. And N here is the same as this one. And so we, recognizing these points of commonality, we glue them together. We sort of link them up by unifying, by, by identifying those, those points of commonality, glue them together around those points, and we get a diagram, then it's an SEIRV diagram. That's the kind of net result, but it's made out of these pieces. And we can always uh, nimbly uh, go and then uh, update these pieces or replace a piece by another piece that's more refined, um, that's more evidence-based and, and build our systems out of reproducible, reusable, um, well-documented, tested pieces, which we can swap out and, and swap in and adopt as we see fit and as we trust them. So um, uh, we've worked to, to, to capture um, this basic composition you see, which is called via resource sharing. And I would highlight the foundational work that like John Buys and Sophie Libkin and Eric and Evan Patterson have done with us to make this possible. This term resource sharing, I think uh, is, is especially one that Sophie at, at Stanford has popularized. Beyond this, we have um, other types of composition that have been formulated within our group. Um, one is upstream downstream, where we kind of stick these together. You can imagine maybe the upstream is like with um, uh, something like uh, mosquito eggs, mosquito larvae, mosquito pupae, pupae and larvae. And then what you get is, um, Another one, which is, you know, uh, mosquitoes that have taken flight, susceptible, infected, recovered mosquitoes with respect to West Nile virus. And you can dock them together, you can or stick them together in an upstream downstream way. So the l mosquito larvae can take flight and go into the other to the other model. So there's an outflow that sticks into the susceptible compartment of the uh, adult mosquito model. Or you can hierarchically compose them. Nicholas Meadows helped us invent these two ways where you take a stock and a given model, maybe it's infective, and you blow it up. And so maybe the stock here is undifferentiated infectives, but maybe we want to represent infectives who are in isolation, infectives who are not in isolation, infectives in the hospital. And, and we can take the stock and replace it by a sub-diagram compatible in terms of the inflows and outflow structure, but which zooms in, which you know now adds richness to just that component of the model. And you could substitute it in it or not as you see fit in a modular way, kind of a Lego-like way, stick it in or you know plug it, plug it off. And there's um, some work that Chayan is doing for composition of machines. Now, all this depends, and I'm mindful of the time, and I'm going to have to finish up soon, on some rich concepts. There's this concept of homomorphisms, these kind of maps between stock and flow diagrams, which are structure preserving, where we have perhaps a, a more elaborate diagram over here on the left and a, and a, and a sort of more aggregate or, or coarse grain diagram on the right. And we can have a map between them which um, uh, is not identity. It, it doesn't just you know, preserve all the structure here, but it, it maps things in a way that is true to their function and preserves the basic connectivity and structure. So the susceptible asymptomatic and symptomatic go to susceptible here. Asymptomatic and symptomatic go to susceptible here. Recovered goes to recovered here. These two flows, be, are summed up and to go into this flow. These two flows go into this flow. And 
fundamentally what we get out is a compatible but coarser grained diagram. It's kind of at a higher level of abstraction than this. This is called the homomorphism. It's a structure preserving mapping. It, homo here is, is in the same, it's the same structure, just in a coarser way. And there's a rich diagram, or there's a rich category of stock flow diagrams with homomorphisms between them, relating one to the other if there's a structure preserving transformation from one to the other, or similarly for causal loop diagrams or for system structure diagrams, categories of each of them. More than that, we can stratify these models. Um, we can do so in a way that's with asterisks is fairly modular. So we can take a given uh, diagram and we can mix in, in a modular way, in a way we could mix in different ones, um, different types of stratum. So we could have, for example, an SEIR model as our base and mix in an age stratum in a way that will produce a, the net effect is a richer model, but where we kind of specify, hey, just mix this in with that and we get out a stratified model. Um, or we mix in a, a sex stratification to this, or we can uh, take an SIS model and mix in age or mix in sex. And the, the net effect of this is we can, instead of hard coding the stratification into our model in some brutal combinatorial way, what we can simply do is elect at any one time, I'd like to take this base model, this aggregate model, and mix in this stratification with say age and sex, but not by risk level. And I get out a stratified model. Um, this depends, these mappings here, are homomorphisms. These are kind of structure preserving mappings from the aggregate down to a type model and from a stratum down to a type model. That's what we need to define what's called a pullback square, where we get out a stratified model that is kind of like the product of what you have in the aggregate for every one of these stocks and a, a kind of crossed with every one of these ones, we get a stock but it's not quite the product because it it allows things to map to the same thing in the type model to be to be uh, identified and 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 not consider all combinations. They they have to map to the same thing in the type model for it to be considered all combinations. Um, so they it it considers combinations of compatible things in terms of how they map to the type model. I know that's that's kind of a vague description, but it's all we have time for right now. So it's kind of like a restrained product. It's not a product that considers all combinations, but just a subset of compatible, compatible combinations. Um, uh, now, a, a beautiful thing about this framework is taking these three powerful types of diagrams system structure diagram, causal, or causal diagram, system structure diagram, stock and flow diagram, and converting them from solitudes into friends, converting them into bosom buddies, um, converting them into recognizing that they're successive elaborations. So for example, we can relate one to the other. Um, we can take a stock flow diagram and abstract it into a system structure diagram. This is particularly simple. We can forget forget uh, information like the formulas. Or we could take more radically a stock flow diagram and abstract it into a corresponding causal loop diagram. And we're working out ways to do this in ways that derive the polarities while doing this mapping so that we can get out a fully uh, polarity labeled cause a loop diagram from here. Um, and this is very powerful because it allows us to relate these diagrams and to recognize that there's successive elaboration, successive sharpening going on as you go down. And there's abstraction going on as you go up where we forget details. We gloss things over. 
And just as we have things like homomorphisms of stock flow diagrams, we have homomorphisms of causal loop diagrams, etc., which can be enriched. Now, you may be forgiven for asking, well, this is all nice working with system structure. What does this have to do with model dynamics, which is much of what we get insight from, from what we get insight? And the answer is, it has everything to do with it, but we don't privilege any one type of interpretation, any one type of meaning or, or understanding from this diagram. We allow a stock flow diagram to be interpreted as differential equations, to be sure. And we can take it and we do what's called, we, we can make it out of pieces. We can compose it out of several pieces. We can stratify it. We can build it up out of all these modular pieces, Lego-like, rather than carving it out of a block of wood through, through whittling and hard coding the structure. We can build it up in a flexible, nimble way, modular, reproducible way out of these reproducible, reusable pieces that we can publish. But then we can map it to a semantic domain. We could say, interpret this as differential equations. Or interpret this as something where I want you to extract a causal loop diagram out of it. And I'm hoping in coming months, we'll be able to say, interpret this in a way that verifies unit, unit correctness of it, that it's dimensionally consistent. Um, Thomas is layering in units and dimensions in here. Or where we might map it to stochastic differential equations. Or you might map it to loop eigenvalue elasticity uh, calculations. So over time, as the model runs, we can highlight which loops are dominating behavior right now. Or map it to, uh, excuse me, that's loop gain analysis or, or eigenvalue elasticity analysis, where we identify what parameters would have the largest effect if we could only intervene with them right now. So there's many types of semantics to which we can mix and match this model. And I think you're getting a sense, I hope, of some of the power of this approach. We can mix and match stratifications. We can mix and match um, uh, different pieces with our diagram. We can mix and match the diagram, the composed diagram as a whole with different semantics. And as you can see, Many of the semantics we routinely apply in our lab, things like particle MCMC, particle filtering, even more prosaic things like calibration or, or simulation, can be captured as semantics within this context. But we haven't left it there. We've sought to build, we've sought to empower teams with technologies here using real-time collaborative stock flow technology. And Eric, with some support from Long, has pioneered this approach. Building atop this sort of structure, building a real-time modeling interface. To work with stock flow diagrams, yes, but soon enough with causal loop diagrams and, and, uh, and the system structure diagrams. And this is built on a, uh, this is actually outdated now. It's, uh, uh, it's got different technologies replacing uh, Conva based on um, underlying technologies from draw.io. Um, but where we have a multi-level web stack using real-time collaborative interfaces for Firebase databases to allow multiple users to interact around a library building up these compositional models. So we can build up models out of these reusable pieces that we can publish and which we can get from a published library and substitute into our model and merge with the rest of our model. So rather than building monoliths of models, we can build them out of these reusable, documented, previously uh, peer reviewed and validated and published pieces um, thereby helping reduce the crisis of, of, uh, of uh, reproducibility within uh, modeling or, or science more generally. So we have much work that's going on now, areas like uh, Thomas has been working on 
incorporation of dimensional structure and, and unit annotations, um, uh, capturing that you know some diagrams might be people or some some model variables might be people, others might be people per day, for example. Um, uh, getting better support for this mapping between diagrams, automatically deducing polarities from maps from abstractions of stock flow diagrams. Um, and, and supporting different types of semantics. Alongside this, um, all this work, we, we wouldn't have been able to get started on that work without the foundational help of John Buys, um, uh, Chris Brown and Evan, or particularly Evan Patterson for, for years now, and, uh, and Sophie Libkin um, also, play, Libkin is playing a, a key role. But, um, alongside this, we've been working to work to apply these similar techniques to agent-based and hybrid modeling. The challenge here, but also the prize here, is, is so much greater. Um, the need so much more acute. So the goal here is to provide a first, namely a mathematical, a rigorous, overarching, syncretic, mathematical foundation for a broad class of agent-based models and hybrid models based on, on uh, declarative use of diagrams, like we've seen, a separation of syntax from semantics so we can interpret a different model in different ways with uh, equal flexibility of different types of lenses with which we can interpret it, all based on this syncretic categorical foundation. And category theory gives us that ability to capture modularity within our models, to capture different types of mathematics, a syncretic aspect. It gives us the ability to capture these different types of logic at different scales. Gives us this ability to describe the model in a visual fashion. And it gives us this ability to do so in a way that encodes models, not as code, which is difficult to publish, reproduce, understand, modify, and, and particularly to draw critique and, and suggestions from people with diverse lived experience and, and, um, and on these uh, interdisciplinary teams, but instead to encode it, ladies and gentlemen, in a way that represent it, represents it diagrammatically and as data. And by representing it as data um, in, a, in a fashion that encodes the mathematical structure concisely and crisply, we can share it, we can publish it, we can migrate it from one version of the schema to another. And we're taking it a diagram to be a higher level of abstraction, which we can reason about to optimize it, transform it, map it to semantics, you know, check its unit correctness. Um, so we're exploring several ways of doing this. Um, I'm I'm very interested in um, uh, rewriting technologies, uh, and, and and recently there's been some bringing in polynomial functors technologies into that, which I'm very, um, very encouraged about. And I think there's some uh, possibilities to bring in uh, stochastic components with Markov categories. Um, all this is, is joint work with, uh, with John Buys and, and uh, Evan Patterson and, and Chris Brown. Sean Wu has been involved for a while. Um, and of course, the leadership team from our lab, people like uh, Shayan. Alex, uh, Thomas Purdy, and uh, Nastaran has joined recently, et cetera. Now, we're going to be evolving this at the uh, International Center for Mathematical Sciences in Edinburgh in May and June of this year. But John and I are in the final stages, nay, the final throws of putting together a, um, a proposal uh, for, uh, for funding from the U.S. National Science Foundation uh, to support this work at a much larger level over the next three years. And um, we're not sure if it will get funded. If it's not, we'll be sure to, you know, try for uh, other sources of, of fundings or other competitions. But uh, we are convinced 
that by bringing these technologies to agent-based and hybrid modeling, we can rise to the challenge of describing the diversity of mechanisms, the larger vocabulary that we see within agent-based models in putting for, for the first time a consistent mathematical foundation that will allow us to build up these models in this modular, reusable, reproducible, transparent uh, fashion, and one that, that allows us to use them nimbly and where different stakeholders can mix in different types of uh, output needs with the model without hard coding those in a way that becomes a large part of model logic. This has been a recurrent um, uh, downside of, of agent-based models. So I'd like to offer a few take-home messages. Um, insightful modeling projects, in my view, are best contributed by interdisciplinary teams. Sysmonymics is a diagram-centric tradition and a stakeholder-focused tradition um, that offers high potential for transparency and team support, but it's really limited. It's really crimped by extant tools. Its potential is grievously shortchanged. And apply category theory empowers teams uh, via transparency, modularity, composition, abstraction, interconnections between diagram types, and cleaner stratification, and enhance semantic flexibility by mapping these things to different semantic domains to, to empower the teamwork that lies at the heart. Of, of impactful modeling projects. And ACT-based systems, such as we're working to support here with support of giants like John and Evan uh, and Sophie, uh, can support system dynamics modeling and teams um, using tools like Eric has been pioneering, Eric Redekop with Model Colab to enable um, modeling with end user familiarity, with a base of category theory, but which doesn't require in any way knowledge of category theory. And that's what we're working towards. Um, so uh, I'd like to uh, you know, refer anyone interested to these resources. I'll see if I can share this with the Cephal group. Won't keep this up because I've got to get to class for a student meeting here. Um, but I, again, want to thank uh, all those who made this possible, um, uh, you know, so so uh, John, Evan, and, uh, and uh, Sophie, uh, and uh, the team uh, in the Cephal Lab, Nicholas Meadows, Alex, uh, Thomas, uh, uh, Eric, and, uh, of course, Xiao Yan, who's really pioneered the stock flow modeling. Okay, well, um, that's all we have time for today. I, I wish I could answer questions, but it was an unplanned talk and unplanned length. So hope that's been given some glimpse of where we're at. And uh, I will see if I can get these slides to you. And I will run off to have this meeting in my office. Thanks so much. Take care there.